While a pandemic of the size and scale we are currently living through feels like an extraordinarily unique once in a lifetime event, this is not the first time something like this has occurred. Human beings have experienced pandemics and outbreaks throughout history. The 1918 Spanish influenza pandemic was one of the worst in our nation's history. Today, our presenters, Dr. Sharon Carlson, WMU Professor Emerita, and Lynn Houghton, Regional History Curator at the Zhang Legacy Collection Center, will walk you back in time to learn what happened at the Western Michigan University, um, at Western Michigan University and the surrounding community during the 1918 pandemic. Dr. Sharon Carlson will start off the presentation today. She is a three-time graduate of Western Michigan University. She holds degrees in history as well as a library science degree from Wayne State University. Dr. Carlson served as the director of the Zhang Legacy Collection Center from 1996 until her recent retirement in 2020. She currently serves as president of the Historical Society of Michigan. Lynn Houghton will follow Dr. Carlson's presentation. She has a bachelor's and master's degree in history from Western Michigan University and a master's in library and information science from Wayne State University. She leads the Gazelle Sports Historic Walks, a series of free architectural and history historic walks around Kalamazoo County held during the summer and fall. And she's the co-author uh, co of Kalamazoo Lost and Found. She also participated in the PBS series, 10 That Shaped America. I hope you enjoyed this program that Dr. Sharon Carlson and Lynn Houghton have prepared, prepared for you. I'll now turn the program over to Dr. Carlson. Does everybody see it? Okay, uh, I think we are good to go now. So, um, influenza at the normal. And uh, I guess just a few words to talk about the origins. You know, where did it come from? And I don't know that um, we have a definitive answer, except that the first reported cases were in Haskell County, Kansas. This was an avian virus that jumped from uh, poultry to humans, and the first uh, appearance was on a poultry farm in Haskell County, and it soon moved to Camp Funston, Kansas, which was about 350 miles away. Uh, there was travel back and forth between the two camps, and uh, the camp had been built in anticipation of preparing troops for World War I. And um, this brings up another point of the uh, influenza, though, that it came in of three waves, and this was part of the first wave. Uh, the first wave was it was not a great you know, virus to have. You had body aches, deep coughing, fever, but it wasn't especially deadly. When we think about the 1918 um, influenza epidemic, we are generally thinking about the second wave, and that was the deadly wave that started late summer and moved into the fall of 1918. Uh, cyanosis, you know, collecting of blood in your body in, in different areas, um, would give the appearance of uh, your body turning black, uh, lungs and heart doubling in capacity and weight, you know, blood flowing from the eyes, nose, um, ears. Uh, you know, death isn't pretty, but if you die from the um, Spanish influenza, uh, it was an even more ghastly sight. The flu um, wouldn't reach Kalamazoo until fall. Certainly there had been lots of reports of the flu. The Kalamazoo Gazette was our primary newspaper at the time, and uh, there had been reports of the flu uh, as it made its way across the United States. Lots of reports of, of things happening at you know, military bases. In fact, when it came to Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo had just finished a very healthy year. I found this article in the Kalamazoo Gazette, and this article um, basically says that uh, you know, recorded communicable diseases. Kalamazoo uh, had experienced very low numbers uh, up through July of 1918. Kalamazoo at the time had about 50,000 um, in population. One of the major industries was the paper industry. Got a postcard from uh, the Bryant Paper Company. 
Uh, there were also agricultural interests. Uh, we grew a lot of celery in the region. In fact, Kalamazoo has been known as both the paper city and the celery city. And uh, so some of the first evidence of uh, you know, the flu coming into the region uh, were reports of things that were happening uh, nearby at Camp Custer. Camp Custer had been constructed um, you know, recently and uh, lots of men were being uh, brought in and, and shipped out to war. In fact, my own grandfather from Lunnington, Michigan was processed through Camp Custer. Uh, they were trying to take steps in September to try and curb the flu, but by October, you know, it was pretty um, evident that uh, the flu was probably not going to be contained. This one newspaper article here cites, you know, 4,000 cases uh, at the camp, October 3rd, 1918. And I have a couple, again, uh, real photo postcards. Those are some of my favorite postcards showing uh, Barracks Hospital and the uh, Red Cross nurses at the camp. It was clear by September, though, that the flu had made its way to Kalamazoo. And in fact, um, September 30th um, says that probably 5% of the population has either had it, is coming down with it, or they're just getting over the disease. And this was that second wave of the flu that was particularly virulent. Um, and throughout this, I will have postcards that show South Burdick Street. Uh, downtown Kalamazoo and Bronson Park, and these postcards are from the time period. I think one of the people who probably had the most foresight uh, concerning the flu was actually Dr. Ostrander. Uh, he was the medical superintendent of the Kalamazoo State Hospital, and in fact, uh, it was reported October 5th that um, he was closing the hospital to visitors. Uh, so that was one of the first uh, you know, closures, restrictions, that, that I saw uh, reported in the local news. Uh, there were stories, uh, this is actually an article from the Western Herald about keeping a close watch for influenza in the city schools. Uh, they were taking cautions at Western. Uh, they referenced something in this article called the SATC, and that is the Student Army Training Corps. And that was uh, a cooperation, a collaboration that Western formed uh, in preparing men for service in the military. And Western has had a long, um, a long history of uh, working with the government. Um, we had the Student Army Training Corps during World War I. We had the B-5 and B-12 during World War II. And of course, today Western is considered um, a veteran-friendly institution. Still, even with some of these things being reported in the news, um, when there was a meeting in Lansing and Dr. Rockwell, who was the city health officer attended. When he came back, he reported that it didn't look like drastic uh, action was really going to be necessary. And in fact, uh, fresh air and plenty of it was going to help in guarding against the influenza. Well, that's true on one hand. And, you know, and when, as I was putting this together, I was feeling like I was reliving parts of March of 2020. Is it going to be really bad? What can you do to prevent it? Uh, but so it was kind of mixed in 1918 as well. Um, still, a couple days later, Governor Sleeper asked, and this was kind of a nice ask. This was not a, uh, a pronouncement. This was not a mandate, but uh, that no public meetings of any kind be held. He was trying to keep, you know, the flu in check. A couple days later, though, it was clear that uh, the cases were starting to climb in Kalamazoo, and. Uh, in my conclusions, I don't talk about uh, women necessarily being um, affected deeply, but I do talk about healthcare personnel. But of course, in this case, in 1918, virtually all of the healthcare personnel that would have been in nursing capacities would be women. And indeed, the Kalamazoo Gazette, uh, there's an article on October 11th. They're asking, it's a very curious article. They're asking for volunteers to go into homes where families are ill with the disease, and then they note at the end of the article, the volunteers are to be paid for their work. Um, apparently, they didn't get too many takes on it, and uh, a couple of days later, uh, Dr. Rockwell and uh, Mary Trafford, who's head of the Red Cross, they're asking once again for women to come forth. They need nurses, and they're particularly interested in women who are 20 to 60 years old and the article from uh, October 13th even says, if you're married and you left the field, 
we would really like you to come back and, and help out. Uh, it's not too long after this that in the city of Kalamazoo, an emergency hospital is established. And uh, this is just kind of an interesting side fact. I've mentioned that we had three hospitals. So an emergency hospital is established on, on South Street. And uh, this is a house that's yeah, it's 817 South Street. Finally, though, October 19th comes and the governor does decide to issue a closing order. This uh, Kalamazoo Gazette headline is curious because the main uh, headline actually is focusing on World War I. And uh, to the left of it, I've blown up a piece about the governor ordering a halt on uh, meetings. And he's talking church meetings, uh, assemblies. It still hasn't affected schools yet. Uh, one of the things he talks about uh, the governor is he wants lodges closed and lodges were a tremendous sort uh, a, tr a tremendous source of uh, social networking, professional networking. Uh, they involve men and women, African Americans, uh, whites, but I'm talking about organizations like the Eastern Star, the Masons. So, so the flu reached Western. As we would expect that would, because Western is an institution that's always been, you know, very much uh, part of the community. And uh, this is a view of what Western, the main buildings, would have looked like in 1918. If you're familiar with East Hall, now Heritage Hall, uh, you may wonder, well, why are there two buildings up there? Uh, the main building, of course, is the administration building. On the right side of that building would have been the gymnasium. And I do have a photo showing the interior of that gym. And that building to the left is what is known as the training school. And Western operated a fully functioning K through 12 program where many students went and did their intern teaching or their student teaching rather than going into the community. So um, this, these were the major buildings. And I've got a couple more that I'm going to show you. The campus was very different at this time. Uh, I know every time I was on campus in the fall, I would say the students look younger and younger. And if you look at the students on the um, left hand side of the screen here, they're children. And that's because we had children on Western's campus. Uh, this is the children's chorus standing in front of the building. Uh, and so we had not only the student population that numbered about a thousand, but we had um, probably a few hundred students that were K-12 students that were primarily um, children from the community that came to the training school. I should also add that I mentioned we had a thousand students. Uh, tuition in the fall semester was $10 uh, for the tuition. And most students lived in rooming houses. We did not have residence halls yet. And students would have paid probably about $6 a week um, to live in the rooming houses. The view on the right hand side of the screen that just shows another nice view of the campus and the tennis courts. The other two buildings that made up our campus uh, included Science Hall, and you may have known it as West Hall. That's a building that's no longer standing. And Western at this time had very recently acquired a building that was being used for the theater. And this is Eames Mill, and this is a building that uh, no longer standing. It's sort of in the triangle where Oakland and Michigan meet. Just to give you a, another sense of the campus at this time, this is a land survey from 1921, and the red stars are illustrating some of the buildings I've just mentioned, with the administration building and the detached training school um, to the left, the science building just across the quad, and then the um, theater building you can see in that little triangle area, and just um, beyond that is where the barracks were located. We had at this time uh, football. This is the football team, 1918. We also had basketball. Women, of course, uh, intercollegiate athletics didn't exist, but um, women participated in a lot of uh, recreational sports and had competitions. This is likely a gym class, and it's in that gymnasium, and it's a uh, room I know very well, having a uh, worked in there when the Archives and Regional History Collections uh, was situated there. And uh, the Western um, normal lunchroom that was in the basement of Heritage Hall or East Hall. So we were on a quarter system then, 
and as the quarter was just getting started, there were moves made to uh, try and curb the influence of the flu at Western. The um, article on the left describes uh, a formation of a health committee, and Dr. Leroy Harvey is the chair of that committee. He was a professor of biology at Western. Harvey Hall is named for him. Uh, he followed this up with an article in the Western Herald, and he tells how to prevent an epidemic. And uh, my next slide will actually illustrate the points that he was talking about, if it's a little hard to read. But some of them are pretty, um, you know, they make a lot of sense, covering the nose and mouth when coughing or sneezing, um, you know, using your own towel and soap, cleaning your hands frequently, avoiding crowds such as the movies. And uh, Western was asking at that point that any student that felt like they were sick or coming down with something, you were to report it. Now, some of them are probably less typical uh, and are more byproducts of what people thought about health at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. Keep the avenues of elimination active. Make sure your balls keep moving. Don't get constipated. And then, of course, memorize these measures and follow them. I don't know if the students actually memorized them. That would have been an interesting one to query. Uh, shortly after this, they put a ban on big gatherings at uh, Western until the flu passes. Only small groups are to be entertained through the various school departments. And they thought by doing that, uh, that it would really help curb the flu. Sadly though, even with the best efforts of the health committee, and uh, reducing the number of students at meetings, our first casualty occurred October 17, 1918. Uh, it was Elsa Nelson, and Elsa was out of Grand Haven. She was uh, president of Western's uh, YWCA. At this time, we didn't have the student government that we have now on Western's campus, and the two main organizations were the YWCA and the Women's League. So we've got the president of the YWCA, and in fact, they talk about some of the uh, things that she had done as her uh, during her brief tenure that uh, she had done to increase the numbers. And she had come up with a system to automatically enroll students, you know, as members of the Western chapter when they were admitted. Uh, she was taken to New Borges Hospital. And uh, if this looks familiar, it's because it's it's the nucleus of Borges Hospital, now part of Ascension Health on Gal Road. Uh, not too many days later, uh, Gabriella Payne perished. Uh, remember when I said that the two main student organizations on campus were the chapters of the YWCA and the Women's League? Gabriella was president of the Women's League. So this is kind of akin to if we'd had the president of the WSA, that's Western's undergraduate student organization uh, on campus today, and let's say the president of the uh, you know, maybe the inner uh, Greek Council or the Graduate Student Association. These were, you know, if there were two big women on campus, it was Elsa and it was Gabriella. Gabriella had been um, a physical education major, kind of a, a, she sounded like a really plucky and optimistic person. Her mother had died, she had finished high school, and then she put off her education to um, take care of her younger siblings, but then she finally, she, she went to Western. Um, sadly, she contracted the flu and she died at Bronson Hospital. The next two people who died on campus uh, were two men who were associated with uh, the, uh, the SATC, Student Army Training Corps. George Habel, um, he was out of Coloma and uh, he was taken ill very soon after he came to campus and Henry James Perkins, uh, another young man who was here and uh, became ill and perished. Um, I think both of them died at New Borges. Seemed like a lot of, uh, you know, and again, uh, I'm looking at this more from a campus standpoint. I know of at least one other researcher who's looking more broadly at Kalamazoo, but a lot of at least Western um, students who died, they, they tended to go to New Borges, so. Around this time, Western closed its extension work. Uh, if you have WMUX, um, WMUX 
uh, has a long history on campus, dating back pretty much to the beginning. Uh, it used to be called extension work and teachers were sent, professors were sent from Western's campus to uh, Benton Harbor and Grand Rapids and they discontinued that. Uh, just like today, uh, the closing ban that the governor put in place was very controversial. Theater owners, uh, people owning restaurants, they were, they were really after, you know, they were after the governor to lift this ban. Seems like deja vu. And so the governor decided to lift the ban and um, made it a responsibility of state, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, of local municipalities. You know, granted the numbers were still rising, uh, only a couple weeks later, another article talks about 300,000 dead of influenza in the US alone. Cases continue to climb and Western decided at last to close the training school. Uh, but they make a note here in this article, the training school is closed. However, the normal school proper has not closed. Uh, that wouldn't happen until December 15th. Western had remained open uh, because it had the Student Army Training Corps. And uh, there's a lot of evidence that at least uh, at what I've looked at that President Waldo was trying to stay in communication with uh, Dr. Rockwell. But it seems that at a point, you know, the city decided they were going to unilaterally close Western, they were going to lose, close Kalamazoo College. And it was kind of a controversial, um, you know, um, meeting. There had been a commission meeting. By this point, we had just entered the city commission form of government, and there had been a meeting, and uh, apparently Dr. Waldo was there, Dr. Stetson from Kalamazoo College, uh, and they hadn't known that um, that the city planned on unilaterally closing these two institutions. I might mention that um, the city hall that they would have been meeting at is a building that has its origins uh, way back in the uh, 19th century, built in 1869, called Corporation Hall. If you are familiar with where the Union Restaurant was located or Gilmore's, this would have been just about across the street or across the mall. But this is the city hall where that meeting would have taken place. Uh, so Western closed about a week before the quarter ended. One of the first news reports when uh, Western opened up again in January was that four more students had died over the holiday. Uh, and their names are included. I don't have as much information here, except, you know, there's information on where these students came from. Jesse Richmond Denny, though, she had a distinction I don't know that she was Western's first non-traditional student, uh, but she was 50 years old and kind of a novelty. And I find that interesting too, because this particular influenza hit the 18 to 40 year olds very hard. Uh, it hit people in the prime of their life. Uh, and she as a 50 year old, probably um, not as many 50 year olds died, but just like what we're experiencing today, we know that it hits the elderly but we also know that children and young adults are dying. So at Western, there were eight deaths out of a thousand students. Uh, Kalamazoo had 126 deaths, but we know that's low because uh, not all of the deaths that were uh, a consequence of the flu were reported as such. Uh, there were lots of people who died later of, of pneumonia. Uh, 600,000 die in the US, again, probably a, a low number, at least 25% of the US population affected 50 million worldwide. And uh, I want to wrap this up very quickly so I can turn this back over to Lynn, but some of the same things, we didn't know how lethal it was going to be. So everybody acted more slowly than they probably should have. Sadly, our students were in the prime age of uh, contracting the disease and the crowded living conditions of the students probably didn't help. I know of faculty who got the virus. In fact, it's reported that Dwight Waldo, our president, um, also had the virus, but they didn't die. And there was great pressure to keep the institution and keep all institutions open. Uh, there was actually more um, reflection after this happened on World War I, but at least in the 1919 and 1920 yearbooks, uh, they mentioned the impact of the influenza and uh, they had a commencement uh, ceremony in 1919. They had a memorial service and they 
honored the war dead, including George Hapel and Henry Perkins, who had died. And there were no long-term changes apparent from the evidence. Uh, however, I would say that every pandemic since, though not as serious, has been felt on Western's campus. And I found evidence of uh, you know, polio. And in fact, when the first polio vaccines became available, uh, there were clinics that were held on Western's campus. And with that, um, I have my little slide on sources, but I think it would be far better to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Lynn Houghton, who's the curator of the Regional History Collections, and she can talk about and she can All right, thank you, Sharon. Uh, thank you, Sharon, very, very much. And good afternoon. As Sharon said, my name is Lynn Houghton. I'm the Regional History Curator. Speaking to you from the reading room of the Zhang Legacy Collection Center, where the archives and regional history collections are located. So what I'd like to do in the time that I have is, like Sharon said, uh, share with you a little bit about some of the resources that uh, Sharon used in her presentation and some of the other resources we have here that deal with uh, the influenza epidemic in Kalamazoo in general, just to give you a little bit of background. So, as she has already said, one of the resources that she used was the Western Herald. Uh, this is the issue from, and you've already seen uh, some of it that talks about the two people, the two women who died. You've already seen portions of that. Uh, the Western Herald began in 1916. It is still ongoing right now, um, although with what was what has been happening, um, they don't, um, they haven't printed it, but they are still producing it. You can find information online with what's going on. The Western Herald is a perfect example of a resource we have here um, that we, yes, we have the hardbound copies. And then over the years, it changed to uh, microfilm. And this was a great way of preserving uh, the resource and also giving people a better access to it. And then not that long ago, we digitized the Western Herald. And so if you would like to yourself after this presentation, sit down and see um, information, read some more about it, you can access the Western Herald through the library website. You can actually, on the library search, you can type in Western Herald. Uh, you can also find it alongside uh, the um, different options they have down there where it says find items. And you can read more about it through the Western Herald. So that's one thing right there. Sharon also mentioned the brown and gold yearbooks. I pulled out three, but the one that I have right here is the one from 1919. And as Sharon said, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see this all that much, but I noticed that just as I was beginning to open up the first page, there is a page there in memoriam to four of the students who passed away including the ones that Sharon had mentioned. And she also had mentioned that through this, you uh, through the uh, that there was information both in the 1919 and the 1920 um, yearbook. The brown and gold is another example of a resource that has been digitized that you too can get a hold of through either the library, um, the library website, you can Google it. Uh, same thing with the Western Herald and it will bring it up. Or again, on the library website, if you scroll down, on the side, you will see the thing that say find items and you can find uh, the brown and gold yearbooks. We have scanned them um, up into from the beginning up into around, I think it was 1970, 1987, around in that area. So they're, they're, I may be wrong on that date, but you've got some really good coverage there. We've digitized, we have other newspapers that are available. Now the Kalamazoo Gazette, which is another great resource to find information about this, uh, you can get it uh, if you come to visit us at the Zhang Legacy Collection Center, and we do have um, uh, we do have appointments now uh, where you can make an appointment to come and see it. It's on one of our databases called America's Historical Newspapers, and we've got a very nice uh, coverage from 1837 to the current day, so you can find information out about what was going on um, in Kalamazoo at this time. Another newspaper that we have digitized uh, for use that you will find on the site um, that you can same places where you can find the Western Herald is the Augustinian, which was a Catholic newspaper um, uh, promote pushed by it was started by um, Monsignor Francis O'Brien 
And I did some searching through the Augustinian. Uh, it was originally the Kalamazoo Angelus, then became the Kalamazoo Augustinian, then the Augustinian. And um, one of the things it said in Dece on December 14th, 1918, it said, the angel of death is visiting the homes of many of our good people. The second visitation of the influenza is thought by many to be more serious than the first. Well, Sharon illustrated that in her talk about what happened there. The Monsignor O'Brien uh, was a, he was the head of the, he was the pastor and the head of the church at St. A's. He had started uh, Borges Hospital and a number of schools. Uh, we have his papers here. We received them a couple years ago uh, when we also received uh, papers from the Congregation of St. Joseph. And it was interesting because uh, one of the things that Monsignor O'Brien did after um, the pandemic, he was serving on the Michigan Historical Commission at the time. He did a survey. Uh, he asked not all hospitals, but specifically religious based hospitals that were headed by sisters, which were most of them, uh, as far as uh, information that they could give him, as far as statistics, as far as uh, how many people did they deal with um, at their hospital in the influence. And so he did this throughout the state of Michigan. Uh, so at Borges Hospital, New Borges Hospital, they said that uh, they had served, they had treated 362 patients with influenza and had 21 deaths. Uh, then there was another letter from the survey from the Nazareth Academy in Nazareth, Michigan, that they had 256 patients, but no deaths recorded. Uh, there was another hospital in Manistee that noted that a number of the sisters were sent down to Camp Custer to help with the uh, soldiers down there with the flu epidemic. So a lot of good information. Some other things that I, I chose, Sharon had also mentioned about the Red Cross. And one of the records we have here at the Red Cross, we have um, the Kalamazoo chapter. Uh, we have their records here. And as you look through the board minutes, they do talk specifically about um, the hospital that Sharon referred to, the Stockbridge Everhart home on West South Street. Uh, they ran it for only maybe two or three months in the fall, uh, but they do talk about the cost of um, that they had a total of 79 patients that they treated between October 17th and November 20th of 1918. Uh, not much more is in the um, Red Cross book, but in the minutes, but it's interesting. Another collection we have here at the archives, which I've mentioned to Sharon before, is one that I have really fallen in love with. It was an organization called the Whatsoever uh, Free Bed Association. And it was a group of uh, women, uh, a lot of churches were a part of it, and they gave money, they started in 1918, and they gave money, uh, donated money, so that those who could not afford it would still be given a bed or two or several beds um, in the various hospitals, specifically at Bronson. So I looked at their records from 1918, not from 1918, but I was looking at from um, 1919, um, and it was, it was interesting with them because when you read them, sometimes what they will do is they will give you, um, they, they will explain why it was that, uh, what people were there for. Now, I, I don't expect you to be able to see this too much because it's a little hard to read. What was interesting is the entries for 1919 and they are providing beds for individuals who are suffering from um, influenza ex exhaustion. And in some cases, these are people that have dealt with this um, for some time. They don't say how long they were there and they don't give a whole listing of who they um, gave beds for or why these people were, were in the hospital. But I thought it was interesting as you look through these that there were some that were there as a result of what they went through um, during the influenza epidemic. So the whatsoever free bed association. Sharon has done a lot of research uh, with the Ladies Library. She has been a longtime member of the Ladies Library Association, which has been a part of Kalamazoo history for many, many years. And she recently was looking at those records as far as what was going on with the Ladies Library Association and how they were dealing with it. Uh, one of the things I was just looking at the minutes, I didn't get as extensive into it as Sharon did, but on October 14th, 1918, 
uh, it was noted in their board minutes that they closed the library in compliance with the health department during the Spanish epidemic, and they were closed from October 14th to November 11th. So that is some, ex some, some examples of some of the resources that we have here that, um, that tell us more about it. And in a lot of cases, you have to look beyond the newspapers to see what other resources that might be there that might be able to give you some more information. So I, I will be open for any questions when it is time, as I know Sharon will, uh, but I will then turn it over to Sarah right now and uh, we can proceed with the rest of our program. Hi, Lynn and Sharon. I am not sure who might like to address these questions, but we've had a couple that have come in. The first is, are they still planning the reunion for the Western High School? Not necessarily related to the pandemic, but um, uh, probably in reference to what you were mentioning in your uh, talk, Sharon. Go Cubs. Uh, I know they postponed it and I've got to think to schedule it, but I haven't heard they're rescheduling it for 2021. Um, so I think if you talk to uh, somebody, they do have somebody they're working with over at alumni relations. And if you were to contact them, they could probably tell you the details. Another question that we have is, um, was it, I'm assuming the influenza, brought to the area by the military? Oh, I bet Lynn will have something to say too, but I don't know that we really know. What I have noticed is that even in the Western Herald, as schools are closing down in the region, people are coming back to campus. It's like they closed school and they're jumping on a train and coming into Kalamazoo to um, you know, meet up with friends in Kalamazoo. So there was a lot of travel, uh, you know, public transportation, trains. I mean, this is still a time when cars are new, people are still using horses and wagons to a lesser degree, but they're existing side by side. And then we have trains and people are regularly taking the trains. And so there's a lot more travel going on and how it got in Kalamazoo I don't think we know, but Lynn, I don't want to say specifically that it was the military, but I, I want to agree with Sharon as far as where people were going and the soldiers at Camp Custer uh, would come to Kalamazoo. I mean, they, yes, they were close to Battle Creek, but they would come to Kalamazoo for various things. And uh, was it possible? I think anything was possible if we've learned from how things can spread. Was it particularly by the military? I would not want to put it solely on them. I think it was probably a combination of um, like what we see with what we've been going on through the last year. Uh, did, did, did soldiers from Camp Custer come here? Yes. Were they the main reason? I don't think we can really say that at this point. We have another question that's come in. Uh, did public health officials recommend the wearing of masks? I didn't see that on the list Dr. Carlson showed. I found no evidence in Kalamazoo that they uh, recommended it. However, I have seen lots of photos from this time period of uh, you know, nurses and people handling the deceased wearing masks. So masks uh, are not a new idea. Hopefully that's answered the question. I, I also want to add as far as other things that Sharon and I have been waiting for. One of the things that we've been waiting for is the results of the research that a colleague of ours has done on the pandemic in Kalamazoo. Sharon Ferraro, who is the city of Kalamazoo's historic preservation coordinator. And she has spent, I, I wouldn't even know how much time she has spent researching what was going on here in Kalamazoo, in the city of Kalamazoo. And she actually did look through a number of just about every death certificate that she could find at that time period to see um, how many, what the numbers would be. And I recently asked her in preparation for this program where she was coming um, with her publication. And she's like, like with anything, um, it's, it's uh, you know, everybody needs more time to do a lot of things. And in, in Sharon's case, she's got the research uh, it's just 
of course, the thing that happens with a program like this, I will say to her, oh, well, I found this in this resource. And so, oh, I, well, I have to see this resource. So I don't know if she's ever completed um, with her research, but she is moving along. Um, there's, there's another question, Sharon, that I think you are much better able to answer this than I am, and that's about the Ladies Library Association. I don't know that I see it, but... Uh... Um, could you expand more about can, the Ladies Library Association? I can read it. Yep. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Julie. Oh, gosh, this could be another program. Maybe it should be another program. They get started as an informal reading circle in 1844. They incorporate in 1852. Uh, they um, have, uh, they build their magnificent building in 1878, and they're still going strong today. And the records are at Western Michigan University's uh, regional history collections in the Zang. And they're a wonderful, wonderful resource. They've been used uh, by many scholars over the years. Somebody asked about what the origins of the name were, and uh, it actually, it's because of King Alfonso of Spain. He suffered and um, he, he had the um, influenza. And unlike um, the French, um, the influenza had been over in France before it hit him in Spain. Uh, it was it was talked about in the newspapers, and so and everything I've read, that's why it's named the Spanish influenza because it was first publicized in any newspapers in Spain. Um, so the name has kind of stuck, and I don't, you know, we we all know that it's it's really it it, it didn't originate in Spain, but it was a name, and it has stuck. Sharon and Lynn, I have a question for you both. You know, we look at what's happening today with um, our current pandemic and your ability to research what happened and put together a picture and a story around what happened in 1918. 100 years from now, when we think about the way that we are archiving material and saving, um, saving, our history in the present. What do you think will be some of the challenges of doing research and what do you think we'll have as opportunities? I know it's hard to think 100 years out, but just based upon how information is created right now, what do you see? Well, um, actually, um, our data librarian has been collecting pandemic stories and uh, she is doing a couple of interesting things with them. Uh, she's getting some kind of qualitative responses as to how the pandemic has affected individuals. But then she's also taking this information and she's coding it and she's creating data sets because that really is uh, an emerging, um, it's, it's the way scholarship is going. Uh, and so that will be one resource uh, because she's working very closely with our, our digital librarian, Amy Baco, and uh, that will be one resource that I think will be around in 100 years because it's been curated by librarians who uh, think, you know, they think decades out uh, when they're taking this kind of information in. Uh, I think a lot of people have probably used uh, some of their um, off time journaling and writing, and, and I would hope that some of these accounts will um, be there and available for others. Uh, Lynn? Uh, along with what Sharon was mentioning with what's been going on here at Western with our data librarian, both the Kalamazoo Valley Museum and the Kalamazoo Public Library have been actively collecting, now in their cases, it's mostly been oral um, information from people rather than physical. I'm not sure yet what they, they have been collecting physically. I think it's going to be a little different uh, because of the technology that we have these days where you're going to be able to collect uh, more oral experiences than um, than maybe written. Uh, certainly when you look at the newspapers, there, it's going to be a little different as opposed to like the bound volumes of the Kalamazoo Gazette or the bound volumes of the Western Herald. We're not going to have that because a lot of it will be um, available digitally. The information is going to be out there. Um, I know that there are many that are talking about archiving that and bringing that information forward. So it's there. It's going to be, I think, in a different format than 
um, a different type than what had been available in 1918, 1919. But you reminded me of another project that um, is going on in the community and every 10 years, the Kalamazoo Valley Museum uh, does a, a basically they solicit they solicit photographs from, um, you know, regional photographers and I mean. Photographers, you know, amateur professional and uh, every 10 years, 2020 was the year that they were due to collect. And so uh, Lynn and I have both been involved in the selection of what they keep. You know, in the past, they would get hundreds of photos. Now that we've gone digital, they get thousands submitted. But Lynn and I are part of a subcommittee uh, that will make final selections. And I think that will be for the Kelms region, probably the best photo documentation that exists um, of 2020 in the years to come. They, they really had to shift their focus because so many of the events that they were supposed to be out there documenting never happened. So instead they're documenting what did happen. And yeah. I agree with Sharon, that's that's gonna be, they're, they're expecting maybe up to 8,000 photographs that we're gonna be viewing. So it's, it's gonna be quite a production. That's exciting. We have uh, two, uh, a couple of other questions that have come in. One from the chat, that is if soldiers died in Kalamazoo, were those deaths recorded on the city's lists of deaths? Well, I don't, it, it could possibly be with the county rather than with the city as far as where they, where they died. And that's one thing when I was talking to Sharon Ferraro about this, um, you know, you're dealing with how many soldiers from Camp Custer um, would die within Kalamazoo County or Calhoun County. Uh, and I don't think there's been an accurate count as to that and that's the thing with so many of the death certificates if you wanted to find information with the death certificates and i think that sharon alluded to it and touched on it uh, they're not going to be in some cases they're not going to be giving influenza so you have to look for other things and with sharon ferraro she was looking for pneumonia so you have to look for other factors that would have been put in there for the death so i'm sure that they are out there um, as far as their availability, you know, what we can see and what's out there. I think it's, that would be a pretty large search to go at it that way. And whether or not on the death certificate, these people would be identified as, you know, military or a soldier or whatever, and they may or may not be, but, uh, that would definitely be an interesting search. There are a couple of questions here that are about um, the any uh, mandates or things that happen. One is, was there significant backlash to mandated closing or restrictions? And then secondly, did any manufacturing close or reduce hours? Um, you had mentioned hospitality, hospitality business, and um, but not industrial. I had only um, heard of restaurants and movie theaters. I had heard of manufacturing but again my focus I, I wanted to have a general overview of Kalamazoo but my focus really was you know Western's campus uh, and and the theater owners everything I have read you know the theater at that point we we did have uh, you know some we had silent film but we had vaudeville coming through and, and we had theaters and and halls of entertainment and the theater owners were just they just wanted to get back in business ASAP. As far as as far as Kalamazoo businesses go, um, there have there's been at least one book that's been written specifically about businesses in Kalamazoo. There have been a number of secondary books that have been written about the history of Kalamazoo. I don't recall, and maybe Sharon can correct me, but I don't recall any mention where they talk about any closures of companies during this time period um, or any disruptions because of that. Uh, and as Sharon already mentioned, you know, paper being a very big product at that time. Yes, pharmaceuticals with the Upjohn Company. Um, I'd have to go back and look, but I don't remember any mention where they talk about closure of businesses. So it seemed to be more in the entertainment restaurant area. And now it was interesting going back to the Augustinian. Uh, there were a lot of things that um, you could that you could continue to research in the Catholic newspaper, and one of them that they mentioned again in the fall in October, um, and this actually dealt with Detroit. Um, there was supposed to be a very large multi-day ceremony for a new bishop coming in, and they had canceled everything for that one. So uh, that's certainly something that could be looked into a little bit more. 
Speaking of looking into things a little bit more, the question that we have here is, are there resources at WMU documenting daily life during 1918-19 pandemic? Like diaries, short stories, or other writings by individuals who used creative writing to document what they were going through. I don't know if Sharon, if you want to touch on this, or I mean, we. I, I, I know yes. we have diaries that cover the 1918 period, and we have diaries even um, of World War One soldiers, but I have not looked at them uh, in a long time to know if they are actually you know, referencing people becoming ill and dying from the flu. And I, I, whenever we have diaries, I'm always curious as far as what they would say about events going on, uh, like wars, like deaths of, you know, presidents. Uh, it would be interesting to see, but diaries, yes, are very good as far as talking about day to day. What they say about, you know, you have to think about what they might say about influenza would be what would impact them on a day to day basis. And if it didn't impact their family, if it didn't impact their life, would they mention it? I don't really know. But uh, we do have them here and uh, they can certainly be, you know, people can look at it if they're interested. I think that would be a really interesting project to take not only diaries that were held at Western, but just diaries of. Kind of everyday ordinary individuals um, for this time frame and and just compare read and and you will find i'm sure that there will be vast differences we have eight civil war era diaries online that's part of our digitized collections and uh, just even amongst eight men their spelling their punctuation you know how much how much they really get into you know the emotion of what they're feeling you know, there's one guy who really does seem to put a lot in his diary and then uh, ranging to another man who uh, it's more of an account book that he's keeping. It's a question here about um, are there websites for our current pandemic? Um, for example, the CDC being documented for the future as well as statements from our government officials that reflect society's response worldwide. So what's being documented now and kept for um, the future research is what I'm reading from this question. Well, uh, one of the last projects I was involved in before my retirement was uh, archiving of websites. Uh, we have been archiving Western Michigan University websites for a number of years. Um, we use a product called Archive It, and we decided as this pandemic started to get underway that um, we would take the areas, at least that the Regional History Collections focuses on, the 12 counties in West Michigan, and minimally try to get capture um, websites from their county health departments and try and capture it that way. Um, you know, with uh, no institution can collect everything and um, my focus you know always was western michigan university and the western side of the state of michigan and you can do a really good job you know if you're collecting and focusing on a specific area so you know but then there are other resources that the university libraries um you know purchases uh you know, lots of current news and you know this will become will be available in, in future years and you know that will take the place of you know newspapers uh, that we used for the 1918 research. We have one last question here, and that was: Was there a pharmaceutical response to the 1918 pandemic? I have no idea. Not I, I'm thinking specifically of the Upjohn company and yep. I don't remember anything at that point in time that they would have created for something like this. I mean, remember uh, so well that when you're looking at antibiotics and um, other things that were made, that was much later than what we're going on right now. Two, yeah. So I, 
I don't remember reading anything as far as as uh, what pharmaceuticals companies were doing, but I don't think there's anything of, about Upjohn responding in any way towards this. Well, we are coming up to the end of the hour. I do not see any additional questions. Um, and so I uh, would like to thank everyone who joined us. I would like to thank Dr. Carlson and Lynn Houghton for delivering this wonderful educational program for us today and sharing with us a little bit of the, the gems that are available to all of us um, in the Zane Legacy Collection Center. So thank you very much for attending. And um, with that, we will go ahead and close this program for today. Thank you for joining us.